appreciate your prayers for that. This morning, 2 Peter chapter 3 will be in verses 1 through 9. So uh, this, this is a warning. Prepare yourself. I'm going to start the message with some what I call next level pastor jokes. <laughs> They're pretty bad, but, but just, just hang with me. Uh, you've heard it said, you know, there are two kinds of people in the world. You've heard that expression of that phrase, there are two kinds of people in the world. Well, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who can keep secrets, and I can't tell you about the others. <laughs> there are two kinds of people in the world. Those with a short attention span and, hey, what's that over there? There are two types of people in the world. Those who finish what they start. All right, we'll be in 2 Peter <laughs> chapter 3 this morning. Listen, I just, bad jokes just prepare you. They help you want to be back in the scripture, right? So just stop giving jokes and talk about God's word. But there are two types of people in the world, and, and that's sort of what Peter is uh, unveiling for us in chapter 3, the first part of it. He's going to tell us that there are indeed two types of people. There are those who scoff or who mock God's promises, and then there are, there are those who believe God's promises. So two types of people in the world, those who scoff and those who believe. And uh, let's read verses 1 through 9, and then we're going uh, to pray. 2 Peter chapter 3, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your poor, pure minds by way of re, uh, remember. Excuse me. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by, by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth, standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that when you give a promise, Lord, it is eternal, it is forever, and it is sure. And I pray, Father, that you would stir up our minds and you would stir up our hearts by your word, that we would be steadfast in our faith. Lord, we would be sure and steady that we'd hold to your word and we look forward to all the things, God, that you have declared and all the things that you have promised us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we get into this text this morning, <coughs> it really is my prayer that if you are uh, discouraged because you've been waiting on something for a long time from the Lord, if you've been praying a prayer for a long time and haven't seen a result, I pray that you will be encouraged, that God's word will really strengthen your faith. And maybe, maybe you're not discouraged, maybe you're actually excited today, maybe you're on the other side of the coin, maybe you're excited about something God's promised you, about something that he's going to do. And so my prayer is that you too will be encouraged to hold on to God's word, because this is the central truth that we get out of this text, that God is faithful to his promises. God is a promise keeper. God is faithful to his word. 
So let's dive in to verse one and two. This is the first thing that Peter teaches us this morning in verses one and two, that we should be mindful of God's word. Being a person who keeps the faith, who keeps believing, who trusts in God, requires that we must first be mindful of his word. And we already read it, but let's read it again. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle. We're in Second Peter, right? He already gave us First Peter. But he says, In both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. The pure mind that he talks about is, is just that your mind has been enlightened by the word of God. You're alive in Christ, right? You're not walking in deception or in darkness, as a person who doesn't know the Lord, you've been born again. The Holy Spirit has enlightened your mind. And he says, I want to stir you up, remind you of these things, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Remember that in chapter 1, We looked at this in verses 12 through 14, where Peter says, I want to remind you. I want to stir you up. Literally, I want to wake you up and help you you be focused on the Lord. Don't be dull. Don't don't go to sleep in the world. Don't go to sleep spiritually. And I want you to remember these things. In in chapter 1, in just a few verses, he used terms for remembering and remembrance three times in a row. And so here he says it again, after he's talked to us about the false teachers and the false prophets, now when he gets back to encouraging and exhorting us, he says, oh yeah, I'm going to remind you. He gets back to that same thing. And I think for us, this is an exhortation and a really important one that tells us uh, that we should never let ourselves get tired of God's word. We should never let ourselves get tired of God's word. I got to watch... Uh, the message last week on the YouTube, or excuse me, on the Facebook feed. And I know Pastor Josh, he talked about how the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And, And it's living. And no matter how many times you read it, God is always speaking through His Word. We've all, many of us, most of us have probably had the, the wonderful experience of reading a verse of Scripture that we know well and then seeing something new, having the Holy Spirit, you know, shine His light on the word of God and on our life and and see something different, see something new, see something, a a little uh, specific insight for where we are in life in that moment. God's word is living and active. And and what this really means is if God's word is dull to us, it probably says much more about us. It certainly says something about us more than it does about God's word. And there are seasons of life when God's word can feel dull to us. There are times when I wake up and open my Bible and it's just, it doesn't seem fresh. It seems difficult or hard. Um, But, but that's just an opportunity for us. And I just encourage you, you know, when those times come, when those mornings come or those days come, look, just apply a little discipline to your life. Just pray anyway and read anyway, right? It's just a battle with the flesh. The flesh would rather be watching television or uh, playing a game on your phone or or shopping, or doing something else, just fulfilling one of its desires. And and so just apply a little discipline. You know, just pray anyway, even though you don't feel it. Just read anyway. Read in faith. Pray in faith. And let the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to revive you, you know, and and to make things fresh again, and just push forward. But we're to be mindful of God's word. Look at that in verse 2. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles. Be mindful, he says. This is essentially a restatement of the command from Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to read some verses to you. This is where Moses gives the law a second time to the nation of Israel before they go into the promised land. And this is what he says. This will sound familiar to you. He says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your hearts. The word of God is not just intellectual. It's not just an academic study. 
The word of God should be in your heart. It affects the heart. And as we'll talk about this, so often the trouble that people have when they come to God's word and they say, well, it doesn't speak to me. It's not an intellectual issue. It's a heart issue. It's a willingness. Are you willing to hear the Lord? Are you willing to be directed by him? Are you willing to open up your heart to him? These words shall be in your heart. Verse 7, he says, You shall teach them, that is the word of God, you shall teach the word of God diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them, the words of God, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you've ever been around an Orthodox Jewish community, or if you've ever traveled to Israel, then you've seen some of this. Every time you go into somebody's house, there will be a little item tacked to the door, right? It's called a, a mezuzah. And it's got in it a little paper with a few verses of scripture on them. And it's literally tacked. You go to an apartment building, Every apartment door in that building is going to have a little mezuzah tacked to the wall, to the doorpost, and a little piece of scripture in there. They, they've, li- they've taken this, this command absolutely literally. If you, if you see morning prayers, the, or- the Orthodox in their morning prayers, they will strap a, a little leather box to their forehead. It's called a phylactery. And inside that little leather box, It is a verse of scripture written down on a little piece of paper, literally binding it to their head as frontlets between their eyes, right? So they they do this in a literal sense. But what is the command talking about? Well, it's very simple, right? Bind them on your hand. Bind the word of God to your hand. In everything you do, in all your work, let it be directed by God's word. Let everything that you put your hand to Everything you work at, let it be directed by the word of God. As frontless between the eyes, everything you see, see it from the perspective and in the light of God's word. How radically does, would that change our, our television viewing habits? And I'm as guilty as everybody in the room. But, but do we look on evil and call it evil? Do we look on good and call it good? Right? Right? So, so just let everything you see be directed by the word of God in the, from the perspective of God's word to see it as he sees it on the doorpost of your house. Let everything that happens in your house be directed by the word of God. Family life would be full and would be spiritual life. Everything in the family Everything that happens in the relationship, in the marriage, everything with the kids, right? Directed by the word of God, everything in the house. You know, this is a description of what it's like to live in the Garden of Eden. This is paradise. Everything I do is directed by the Lord and everything I see, I see in the light of God's word and his truth and everything that happens in all my relationships in my home and in my family are directed by the word of God. This is, Lord, Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We sang it this morning already. That's what this is. God's will being done. And look, this isn't like a burden. This isn't like, here's your list for today. You must check every box before you go to sleep. And then, child, you may rest. That's not God's command to us. No, this is just walking, living in step, in tune, in harmony, in fellowship, relationship with God. Okay, Lord, like we talked about some months ago in a message, all right, Lord, the kingdom of God is my purpose today. My purpose today is, God, whatever God wants to do about his kingdom, that's what I want to do today. And all, all the things I do, I want God's kingdom to be built or somebody to be encouraged, just whatever God's kingdom is about, whatever his purpose, his will, let that happen today. And then Jesus is my focus, keeping my eyes on the Lord. And I'm going to honor God in all I do. You know, it's just walking in relationship with him. And so Peter says, look, he says, be mindful. Be mindful of the words. Saturate yourself, direct yourself, 
Saturate yourself in the Word of God and direct yourself by the Word of God. Let it have its place in you. Let it have its home in you. And then notice that he talks about both the Old Testament Word and what we call the New Testament Word. He connects them together, links them. Be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the Holy Prophets, spoken before, before Peter, and the commandment of us, he says, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Those apostles that Jesus called and that he gave authority to and that he appointed. And he links them together and he says, listen, what the Old Testament prophets wrote and what we, the apostles, are writing are both the word of God. Be mindful of both. By the end of the chapter, he will loop in the apostle Paul and the writings of the apostle Paul. Paul said of himself, I am an apostle out of sort of born out of season because he wasn't chosen with the rest of the apostles during Jesus' earthly ministry. He was chosen after the resurrection of Jesus. And yet Peter will give credence to him and say, yes, also the things that Paul writes. So we have the New Testament record, the New Testament scriptures given an equal footing with the Old Testament scriptures as the very inspired word of God. Look, when we talk about Scripture, being the Word of God and being inspired, you know, one of the elements or one of the proofs of this is the perfect consistency and harmony that they have between them. Peter says they're both from the Lord. They're the same thing. They're connected together. They're inseparable. Maybe you've heard this little rundown of of stats on the Bible, but I love it. You know, the Bible is 66 books written by 40 authors on three separate continents in three different languages over 1,500 years. And yet there is one message, right? 66 books, 40 authors, three continents, three languages, 1,500 years, and a single unified message. The doctrinal consistency between Moses and David and Jesus and John. It's perfect. The Bible itself claims to be the word of God and it claims to be consistent as it does here. And so for us, what that means as people of the book, what that means is that it's, it's dishonest on our part to, to come along and then try to pick and choose well, I'm an Old Testament person, or I'm just a New Testament person, or I like Jesus and John, but I'm not a big fan of Paul. And I've, maybe you've had these conversations with others. I've had conversations with people, oh, I really like what Jesus says, but, but I don't really follow Paul. You can't separate them. You can't separate, you can't break apart the word of God. Either it's all true or it's all false. If you're going to be honest with the text, it claims to be cohesive, and it claims to speak with one voice. And I believe that if you study it with an open heart and an open mind and just take it for what it says, you're going to find out the unity and the power of the Word of God. Be mindful of it. I love Psalm 119.89. Very simple statement. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It is settled in heaven. God has declared his word. It is settled, it's unchanging, and it will happen. It will happen. Peter tells us to be mindful of all of God's word. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody try to reason with you or convince you that you can pit Moses against Jesus or Paul against James or John against Peter. They all speak with one voice. Be mindful of the whole of God's word. Now, be mindful of God's word. Now, Peter is going to tell us this. He says, there are those who scoff at the promises of God. Look at verse 3. Knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. 
and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In the last days, he says, scoffers will come. Very quickly, what are the last days? In the broadest sense, the last days began at the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out after the ascension of Jesus. Remember, they, God poured out his spirit and they spoke in tongues and they preached the gospel in Jerusalem and many were saved. That's the birth of the church. Peter stands up on that day and tells us that it was a fulfillment of a prophecy from Joel, a prophecy about the last days, that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit. So that's when the last days technically begin in scripture with the birth of the church. So we understand that we are in the last days now. Why, is it the, why do we call it the last days? Well, give me a very practical reason. Because in the view of scripture, the promise that we're waiting to be fulfilled in the last days is the return of Jesus for his church. We are looking for the coming of our Savior. And Jesus can show up at any time. He can show up at any time for his church. So that means every day could be the last day. You know, today could be your last day. Today could be your last day. Partially because, right, we're all, we're all human. Nobody's, you know, nobody's uh, going to escape death, right? COVID could get us. Car accident could get us. Cancer can get us. Today could be your last day. Like, thanks for pumping me up, Pastor Daryl. <laughs> Today could be your last day. But listen, every day that's not your last day gets you closer to the last day when Jesus comes for the church. So there's just an ever-increasing building sense of urgency. Every day the church exists on the earth could be the last day, and every day that passes gets us closer to the last day. So there should be a sense of urgency in the Christian life, uh, at least a sense of awareness about who we are and what we're doing and what the Lord's called us to, right? But one quality of the last days, Peter says, is that as we get closer to the return of the Lord, scoffers will come. The longer this thing drags on, the more and more people will show up and say, ah, I've been hearing about this whole Jesus coming back for a long time. They were talking about that when I was a kid. They were talking about that in the 1800s. They were talking about that in the first century. Scoffers will come. Notice, though, the quality of these scoffers. They come walking according to their own lusts. That is, they share, all, they share the basic character trait and quality of the false teachers and the false prophets that we read of back in chapter 2. They don't live according to God's word. These, they, they live according to their own lusts. They're not trying to obey God's commands. They're obeying their own appetites. The lust of the flesh... Uh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, as John talks about in 1 John, these, these things are of the world. This is his description of the worldly system and the, and the natural man, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That is basically living for possessions, living for passions, and living for position. This is what drives people. You know, if you think the world's about to end and Jesus is going to show up, it's really hard to get your agenda done. Oh, but I have passions that need to be fulfilled. I have possessions I want to gain. I have a position to attain. And if Jesus comes back, he's going to ruin it. Or maybe more directly, those aren't the things that Jesus wants for my life, but I want them. And if I think he's coming back, then that makes me accountable. And I don't want to be accountable. I want to do what I want to do. And so they deny his coming and they scoff at his coming. Notice that this is an attitude not in the world, Peter says, but this is an attitude in the church. Where is the promise of his coming? Verse 4, for since the fathers fell asleep. Who are the fathers? The church fathers or the fathers of Israel, the fathers of the faith. 
See, this is an attitude that develops within the church to deny the coming of Christ. Never, never sit under, let anyone tell you that the return of Jesus isn't going to happen or that God's kingdom is not going to be set up or that judgment won't come. Oh, all things are just going to continue just as they always have. This is what they say. They doubt his coming. And really, it's an attack against his word. Where is the promise of his coming? Verse 4. They're attacking his word. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself. Jesus promised his return. Jesus promised our reunion with him. And to dismiss that is to attack the word of God, just like Satan did in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say you couldn't eat? It's evil. It's evil, right? They attack the word of God. They make broad, sweeping generalizations. Oh, well, things have always been this way, and things will always continue to be this way. The great theological retort is poppycock. A little more modern vernacular. Give me a complete break. Read the word of God. Read the word of God. And he's going to take us to an example in the word of God. <clears throat> Verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. They willfully forget God's past judgments. They willfully forget that God is a God who intervenes in the affairs of men. They want you to think that God is somehow as a creator is just disinterested. That he just wound up the clock and he set it on the table and it's just going to wind down until it's done. It's bizarre, really to conceive that there's a God, a creator, who is then detached from his creation. We acknowledge that there is a higher power, but he's not really concerned about us. If he's not concerned about you, why did he make you? Why did he give you breath? Why did he give you life? Why did he give you his word? Why does he speak out of heaven to get your attention? Why does he work in individual lives why does he preserve your life? Some of you should be dead. And God has preserved your life till this day so that you can know him. But they willfully forget. They choose not to believe. I've had so many people tell me, and I know you've heard the same things. Well, I want to believe. I just can't. I can't reconcile creation and evolution theory. I can't believe this or that. I can't reconcile these things. Listen, it's not that you can't. It is simply that you will not. It is an act of will. Are there legitimate questions that people have? Absolutely. Are there excellent answers, perfect answers out of the word of God? Absolutely. I'm not dismissing that we should understand God's truth and apply it to our world and understand the arguments that the world would try to make against it and have good answers for those things. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. But at its core, not believing is not an intellectual problem. It's a heart problem. It's a willful choice not to believe. They willfully forget, and this is what they forget. Peter says they forget that God judged the world. They deny that God judged this world through a flood. How true that is today. They forget God's judgment. You know, today, a worldwide flood in the past is the absolute best explanation for a whole range of phenomena that we see in the natural world. The layers of sediment. The fossil record. Worldwide fossil record. How is that possible? Fossils get created when things are buried quickly. Worldwide flood. You know, you can go to the mountains, you can go to the Rockies in Colorado, 
to a place called the Minturn Formation in Colorado today, and you can find seashells in the mountaintops. And they'll tell you that there used to be a sea, and over 10 million years it receded, and it came back, and these things settled down. There was a flood, and everything that was on bottom got put on top, and everything that was on top got put on bottom, and it all settled out. And that's why we have seashells in the Rocky Mountains. But they willfully deny, they willfully forget, because then they have to acknowledge that God holds his creation accountable. God judged the world in the past, and he will judge the world again in the future. Listen to this. By the way, I just love how technical and how accurate. Remember how we said the, the word of God is connected, old and new? By which the world that then exists, excuse me, no. Here we go, five. They willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. By the word of God, the heavens were of old. God created the world by his word. He said, let there be light. I don't know if he said it like that, but we like to imagine it in Morgan Freeman's voice. <laughs> let there be light, right? Let there be land. He created the oceans. He created all the creatures. He created everything. By the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of water and in the water. You go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, and you get the description of creation. The earth standing in and out of water. And we find out that God created the firmament, the atmosphere, and he separated water from water. We had water above and water below. We know the water below. It's called the ocean. Right? The water above, we believe, was a great water canopy, which makes perfect sense in protecting our world from the harmful rays of the sun. When you go into Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, and you read about the flood coming, it says that the deep was broken up, water came from below, and the windows of heaven were opened. That canopy of water fell down in rain, water from both directions. It's just one line. Technical, isn't it? Amazing how God's word is connected, old and new, Peter talks about it, being flooded with water. God judged the world. So by the word of God, it was created. By the word of God, it was judged in the flood. And by which, verse 6, the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word. Today, the word of God created the world, the word of God judged the world, and by the word of God, our world today is preserved. Our world today is preserved by the word and the power of God. You know what Colossians says about Jesus? Colossians chapter one says that all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. In him all things consist. He's the power of creation, and he's the power that holds it all together. In our study of natural matter, we keep trying to get smaller and smaller and smaller. We get down to the level of the atom and the parts of the atom, and, and we still don't know what holds atoms together. We know that if you break one up, there's a big boom. But we don't understand the forces that hold atomic material together. We don't understand how they can be in balance. We don't understand how they got put in balance. If you adjusted any of those, um, uh, what's the right word? Any of those elements, any of those uh, distances, any of those factors, that we understand that exist in an, in an atom, if you adjusted any of them by a slight percentage, matter could not exist. The world would not hold together. It's a basic study of chemistry. But in him, all things consist. Why, even as humanity, moving from the physical world now to social, political why is the world itself, why have we not killed ourselves? Why, why have we, that was terrible. 
Why have we as human beings not already brought total destruction upon the world? We've had world wars. We've had famines and plagues that were our own creation. It's because he preser- he's preserving the world. As nuts as the world is, it is being preserved. Left to our own devices, we'd have already destroyed ourselves. Why is he preserving it? And this should be very sobering. He's preserving it so that he can judge it. It is reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God's word spoke the world into existence. By God's word, it was judged at the flood. By God's word, it is preserved today. And by God's word, it will be judged again. Why would we deny the return of the Lord and the judgment of the world? We've already seen it happen. It's already in the record of the natural world. We have it already in the word of God. We shouldn't doubt. But people will always be in denial of the coming judgment until it arrives. You know, Jesus said this would be the case. And he even referenced the flood in Noah's time, just as Peter does. See, Jesus said, at the coming of the Son of Man, it will be like the days of Noah. They will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. They'll be in denial. The judgment's going to happen. They're just going to be going along in life. Right? And then the Lord will return. So there are those who scoff. But there are those who believe. Remember two kinds of people in the world? Those who scoff and those who believe? He has some encouragement for us as we finish. Those who believe. Verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. I love he says, I love how he says that. But beloved. He just told us about world ending judgment by fire. That can shake us a little bit. So then he comes back and says, But beloved, God loves you. It's okay. But beloved, you're his. You belong to him. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Here's the first thing that he's going to encourage us with. Know that God is beyond time. Look, the test of faith is the test of time. Okay? The test of faith is the test of time. If we didn't have to worry about time, we wouldn't need faith. We need faith because we're waiting on the Lord. Faith is just trusting the Lord to do what he said he's going to do it at some point in the future. The test of faith is the test of time. But don't feel alone in this. Okay? This is the pattern of God's work in every believer's life. In the big picture, we're all waiting for his return. But you know, even in your life, there are things you're waiting for. You're waiting for the promises of God. Lord, why hasn't this happened yet? Lord, I thought you were going to do this. Lord, why isn't this fixed yet? Well, listen. If you just go back and read your Bible, you'll be reminded that it took about 25 years for Abraham to have a son after God promised him he would become a dad. 25 years. It took Joseph about 15 years from the time that God revealed to him that he would be a ruler until he actually became VP of Egypt. Right? It took David at least 15 years from the time he was anointed to be king to the time he began to rule in Hebron. And then it was another seven years until the rest of the tribes joined in. Moses felt a call in his heart to be the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. He tried to do it his own way, murdered a man, got run out of town. It was 40 years before God sent him back to be the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. Time. You just, you just read your way through the Bible and you find out all God's people, there's, a, there's, there's time. And, and, and that's why we have faith. We believe God's promise that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. We have to give it time. Pastor Sandy Adams up in uh, Calvary Chapel, Stone Mountain, we would go up there every year for a, a pastor's conference for a couple of days. 
And I just remember this year, he gave us an awesome message and he, he called it Godly Grooves. And he based it out of the Psalms where it talks about how I will obey the word of God and it will enlarge my heart. It will enlarge my heart. Like with God's, with obedience comes enablement. You know, as we just choose to follow God's path, he makes it possible for us to do it. And he just talked about how important it is to have godly grooves in your life. Just, just good habits, pursuing the Lord, you know, um, being in his word, th those types of things. And just thought, I said, now, now once you establish that habit, just give it some time. Give it 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 years and see what the result is. You see, you see, God is faithful. We just need to wait on him. And, and Peter says, look, remember now, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day to the Lord. Look, he created time. Time is a creation. He is eternal. He said, I am. I am. Right? He's the one who was and is and is to come. He's eternal. He's above time, beyond time. For him, one day is like a thousand years. He can do a thousand years worth of stuff in one day. God, we're running out of time. Lord, I've been waiting on this promise for a long time. Lord, my family's not fixed yet. It's been a long time. We're getting old down here, Lord. I'm running out of time. Think about this. Jesus the incarnation, born, a baby. We get one little glimpse of his life at 12 years old. And we don't hear anything about him until his public ministry begins and he's around 30 years of age. And Jesus has roughly a three-year public ministry before his death and resurrection. So let's just say he was on earth for 33 years and three of those were in public ministry. A mere 10% of his life. And what did Jesus accomplish? See, God doesn't need a lot of time to do a lot of stuff. We get nervous because we think the clock is ticking down, but to him, one day is as a thousand years. And the opposite is true. A thousand years is as one day. Time is not a limitation for the Lord. He's not hindered by it. It doesn't relay his disinterest or his forgetfulness or, or any such thing. Actually, time is a tool for him. And mostly, I believe, it's a tool to develop faith in us and Christ-like character in us. So don't get stressed out about the time. We can patiently wait. And we can, in peace, trust that the Lord will be faithful to his word. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the first thing to encourage our faith is to know that God is beyond time. And the second thing to remember, which I believe Peter tells us here in verse 9, is to remember that God is good. God is good. Why has the Lord delayed his coming? Because he wants as many people as possible to have the opportunity to be reconciled to him through Jesus. Any delay, and then I'll make the application to our individual lives right now, any delay is to our benefit. See, we think we're getting tortured. We think like the Lord forgot about us. We're not sure if we're worthy of his love. You're not. Don't worry about it. It's Jesus. He loves you. Right? But any delay is to our benefit. It's to our benefit. Peter says the essential reason that Jesus has not yet returned and that God has not yet judged the world is that God is gracious, giving opportunity for people to repent and to believe and to enter the kingdom of God. 
If Jesus had come back five years ago or 10 years ago, who in the room would not be in the kingdom of God? If God had come back 50 years ago, some of us wouldn't be alive. God desires that people would be reconciled. You know, that's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, today is the day of salvation. Listen, if God is delayed, it's because he loves us and he's being gracious and there's opportunity for us to come to him. So in the realm of salvation, for anyone who has been putting off the conviction of the Holy Spirit and refusing the prodding, which you know is the truth, that God loves you and Jesus has died for you and you have not yet yielded your life because you don't want to give up your will and your passions. God has been gracious to you. Don't wait any longer. Today is the day of salvation. This is the last day. This could be the last day. And if it's not, tomorrow could be the last day. And if not, then we're even closer to the last day. I also think about this in terms of, of our service to the Lord, our obedience to the Lord. You know, there are things that God has told me to do in the past, and I just didn't do them. I knew it's what he wanted me to do, but I just put off obedience. And I've paid some consequences for that in my own life. But how long? How long have we waited to serve God? How long have we waited to obey his call? How long have we waited? Can we wait any longer? Listen, his patience is grace toward us, but look, today is the day of salvation. Today is also the day of service. Today is the day of obedience. Today is the day to be surrendered to God's will. It's his grace. He loves us and he calls to us and he gives us opportunity. Two kinds of people in the world. Those who scoff, and those who believe. We need to be reminded of God's word to always put it before us that we might be strong in our faith. We need to be aware that there are those who are scoffers who will say that God's word is not true and that he's never judged the world and he won't judge it again, but we know that he will. But mostly we need to not lose heart we need to endure in faith, trusting that the Lord will indeed, knowing that the Lord will indeed accomplish the good things that he's promised to do in us and for us. And we know that he will return and he will establish his kingdom on earth. We know that there will be judgment of the ungodly. We know that his plan will be finished. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that we can trust your word. There is nothing as sure in existence as your word. Lord, I pray you would strengthen our faith today. Lord, I pray that you would encourage those, Lord, who have been discouraged. Lord, those who have been waiting a long time. Lord, help us to see again your promise. Help us to see again your character. Lord, strengthen our hearts. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Lord, and if there's anything urgent that we need to do, Lord, may it seem urgent to us. Lead us by your spirit. Give us grace, Lord, to go forward in your callings and in your good works. And Lord, we desire that those around us would know you. Lord, use us as instruments of your grace and the gospel to go out and to share with people, Jesus, that you died for their sins and that through you they can be reconciled to God. Lord, we pray that you would put words in our mouth this week. Give us those opportunities and give us boldness and wisdom. Father, please bless your people today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.